I am not a farmer. If I were, I'd be a bad one. But I do have one planting success story. It's not the flower seeds from two weeks ago. That was a major fail. Uh, I trusted, well, I have one little tiny speck of green after two weeks, and I, I believe I have drowned the seed. So. But soon after getting married, Cindy and I wanted rose bushes by the front door. I planted for them. I cared for them. I pulled weeds. I watered them. I pruned. And we got beautiful roses. I'm sorry that I don't have pictures because I didn't know it was going to be my only success in 35 years. <laughs> Basic problem is I'm impatient. I don't like that time between burying the seed and when the plant shows up. And then the next agonizing wait between when the plant shows up and you get fruit or a flower. It's just, it's too slow for me. When it comes to growing people and growing my family, I've had to learn patience. You plant values in your children and you pray you will one day see the harvest. And at times you wonder if what you're planting will ever grow. But remember the promise we have, Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Here's the promise. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, God's time, we will reach a harvest if we don't give up. One of the principles we learned is what you plant is what grows. You can't grow what you don't plant. Plant right things in your family, in your marriage, in your children. You may not see amazing results overnight. It may not come as soon as you want, but one day you'll reap the harvest. Some of you are waiting on that harvest in your kids or your grandkids. I'm praying and believing with you that harvest day is coming soon. If you plant wrong things in your family, you reap a negative harvest. Again, may not be overnight or immediate, but if you plant criticism, you'll reap negative attitudes and behaviors. If your kids always hear you criticizing others, one day your kids will criticize you. If you plant anger, your harvest will be anger. Arguments, out of control kids. If you plant selfishness, your harvest will be a family that only cares about themselves. You get what you plant. So I wanna challenge you to plant three more good things in your family. The first is faith. And you might say, well, we got that covered. We're here. Well, I'm excited to come to church. That's a wonderful start. We'll do everything we can to point your kids and students in the right direction. But the primary responsibility is not ours. It's yours. You have to lead your family in faith. Planting faith can be challenging. So here's some basic seeds you sow to reap a harvest of faith. Number one, be a lifelong follower of Jesus. That's pretty basic. You can't lead someone you've never been. Unless you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you can't lead your family in faith. One of my favorite Bible stories is found in Acts 16. Paul and Silas were in jail. Uh, God sent an earthquake to tear down the jail and let them be free. And the jailer knew he was in trouble for losing prisoners, but Paul and Silas didn't leave. The jailer called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out, and he said, interesting question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord over him and all who were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night. He washed their stripes. He cared for their wounds, and immediately he and his family were baptized. They didn't wait till the next Sunday morning. They didn't wait till baptismal service. They we're in now. When he brought them into his house, he set food before them. He rejoiced, having believed in God with his whole household. The jailer found faith, and he then led his family to faith. To lead your family in faith, you first need to be a lifelong follower of Jesus. Some of you need to make that decision today. Seed number two, talk about faith. Discuss the Bible together. That's why we put family devotions in the bulletin. We want to facilitate spiritual conversations in the home. Do the devotions together. Talk about what you've learned. Ask your kids what they learned. Talk about faith. Deuteronomy chapter 4 says, Only be careful and watch yourself closely 
so you don't forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Seed number three, model your faith. Your family needs to see your faith in action. They need to see you live a life of integrity, a life where your words and your actions match. Someone asks if you can help them Saturday, and you say, oh, I am so sorry my kid has a project, but he doesn't. You're using your kid as an excuse to avoid telling a truth, and then you wonder why your kids lie to you. Your children watch you every second. They're checking the consistency of your words and your actions. It's not enough to talk a good game. You have to live it out. Words are powerful. Actions are more powerful. If you want kids committed to Jesus, they need to see you committed to Jesus. Here's the principle. You get what you demonstrate. Not what you declare. You get what you demonstrate. Uh, The old maxim says, you teach what you know, you reproduce what you are. Seed number four, pray with your family. Not just at mealtime, that's good. But but if you've watched your family at mealtime when you pray, sometimes they're digging in while you're still praying. It's become really rather perfunctory kind of something we do. Uh, Instead, that's fine. Pray for your food. But when someone is sick, pray. When you face a challenge, pray. When you have a victory, pray and thank God. Make prayer a regular, normal part of your family experience. Seed number five, make church a priority. If you want your children children to make church a priority, you have to make church a priority. We inherit priorities from parents. If you want your kids to be faithful to church in their teenage years, you better start in their preschool years. Now, can you be an effective, full-time, lifelong follower of Jesus without attending church? Lots of people tell me they can. I guess it's possible. I've never met one. Plants grow because they get food and water. People grow in relationship with Jesus because they get spiritual nourishment and because they have other people around them who are on the same journey. That best occurs at church. When you plant seeds of faith, your harvest is faith. When we were raising Pastor Parker and Pastor Tyler... We wanted them to be successful and wealthy so they could care for us in our old age. I wanted them to buy everything I ever dreamed of. That's the same thing you want for your kids. But we would rather them be lifelong followers of Jesus. Nothing matters more than that. So many of the arguments we had when they were kids, I now recognize as completely irrelevant. There is no telling how many times Parker and I argued about his haircut. He did some horrible, crazy things with his hair. And now I don't care about his hair. He doesn't have much to care about, but I don't care about it. What I care is that he follows Jesus. We used to argue about algebra grades. Algebra. Algebra. When do they use algebra? The only possible time you can ever use algebra is when your kids then take algebra. And if you remember something, but then they change all the rules anyway, it's completely irrelevant. We argued about something that didn't matter. I, now I never say, uh, hey, uh, Tyler, what is X to the second minus ABC equals 27? We've never had that conversation. We don't care. Faith in Jesus matters. Now, you're just saying, Pastor Otto, you're saying my kids can fail algebra in school? I didn't say that, but if they make a high D minus, good to go. <laughs> it doesn't matter. What matters is they follow Jesus. So many of the things we argued and stressed about, now on this end of it, looking back, I say, who cares about that? Who cares if they eat Twinkies for breakfast? They're following Jesus. Why did that ever matter to us? Second thing I challenge you to plant in your family is commitment. Which, by the way, that algebra thing, some of you are worried because you have students that will be in the next service. I'm probably going to say it again. So (laughs) I, I won't be able to help it. Just the anointing, it just comes out. 
Commitment's sometimes a confusing word. Uh, do you commit to being a class pastor? Do you commit to teaching fourth grade girls Sunday school? Uh, what does that commitment mean? How far does that commitment go? How important is your ministry commitment? How much do you balance your ministry commitment, your family commitment? Uh, my boys, they understood I'm not willing to sacrifice my family for the ministry, but we will sacrifice together for ministry. Is signing up to bring donuts next week, is that a commitment? When we say we're going to attend church regularly, what makes those words a commitment? My definition of commitment when it comes to family is a lifelong decision. One of my favorite passages is in Joshua 24. Joshua is addressing the people. He says, now fear the Lord, serve him with all faithfulness. And then he kind of doubled down. He said, throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped and serve the Lord. That's commitment when you throw away your other gods. Throw away anything that comes before God so you can't go back to it. Eliminate your options. Joshua went on to say, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, choose yourself this day who you're going to serve. Whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites, and whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Choose who, will you, who you will serve. In other words, time to make a commitment. Commitment is not words you say. Commitment is a life you live. It's not something you say in a wedding ceremony because it's a tradition. In a family, commitment is a lifelong decision. I was raised to believe if I gave my word, nothing mattered more than keeping my word. You don't hear much of that anymore. We live in a time of disposable commitment and ever-shifting priorities. We've made a mistake as a society and a church, forgotten an important principle. You get what you tolerate. If you allow something to go on long enough, you'll keep getting it. We have tolerated casual commitment for far too long. We've treated our word lightly. We have tolerated casual commitment to marriage, casual commitment to church, and casual commitment to Jesus. If you tolerate something long enough, that's what you get. We've tolerated lack of commitment in so many areas, and then we wonder why people don't honor commitments. You get what you tolerate. Marriage shouldn't be taken lightly. Marriage is a commitment that's intended to last for a lifetime. I love celebrating with couples who've been married 50 years. They made a commitment and stuck to it. Tomorrow, Cindy and I celebrate 35 years of marriage. That's a long time, 35 years. I don't know how she did it, but I'm glad she did. You plant commitment by planting the seed of a no matter what mentality. In your wedding vows, you probably said something like this, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. When you said that, what you counted on was better, richer, and health. You didn't say those words expecting worse and poorer and sickness. But difficulties come. And all too often, you look around and say, wait a second, I didn't sign up for this. This isn't what I expected. I can't do this. Commitment says I'm with you no matter what. I'm with you, you're with me, we're stuck. Commitment is not a matter of conditions. It's a choice. I choose to love Cindy. Does she irritate me occasionally? Yeah. And I suppose that perhaps, I can't remember the time, but maybe once or twice in 35 years, I've irritated her. It's possible. I can't see how, but maybe. We've had good times and bad times. Commitment says, in the good times, I'm excited to be committed. In the bad times, I choose to be committed. My commitment is not based on feelings. My commitment is not based on circumstances. It's a choice that I've made that I'll honor. There is no way out. There's only a way through, and that's together. The church has treated marriage far too casually. And it's time for people to stand up to their commitment, live up to their word, and stick with it. Amen. To, com 
to plant commitment in your family, eliminate all other options. If you're committed to the Arkansas Razorbacks, you're their fan, period. If they have a bad year, are you going to switch to the Texas Longhorns? No. Ooh, that should not be on the screen in this building. <laughs> Some of you won't even allow that color in your home. You're never going to be a Texas Longhorn because when you decided to be a Razorback fan, you knew there might be a bad year. <laughs> or 12. <laughs> but you decide, I'm a Razorback fan. There are no other options. Make the commitment. This is my family. This is my spouse. These are my children. I abandon any other options, and I will do whatever it takes to fulfill my commitment to this family. Commit. And when you do, commitment grows security. Your spouse, your children know you're committed. That makes them feel secure. Commitment grows endurance. It lasts. I'm committed. That commitment helps me get through times where others would give up. I'm committed to Cindy. I'm committed to Tyler and Parker. That commitment makes me endure. I will not quit. I'm committed. I am committed to be a lifelong follower of Jesus. Do things happen I don't understand? Yes, lightning strikes. We've been there. Are some days frustrating? Yes. Do Christians sometimes treat me bad? Yes. Will that cause me to walk away from church and faith? No, because my commitment is not based on whether you're nice to me. My commitment is based on the fact that he died for me. <laughs> Planting seeds of commitment produces a harvest of endurance. Now, even as I talk, some of you regret past commitments you didn't live up to. My goal is not to beat you up for those failed commitments. God forgives your past, and so do we. Instead, my goal is to forge a new commitment to you, commitment to your spouse, to your family, and to Jesus. Some of you are right on the verge of walking away from a commitment you made before God. I challenge you to stop now and to keep your word, to honor your commitment. You say, but it's difficult. I didn't say it was easy. Well, but I don't feel like it. I don't care what you feel like. I care about what's right. If you let feelings govern your behavior, you can do all kinds of stupid things. To build a strong family, you must commit to God, your marriage, and your family. If you're married, renew your commitment to your spouse. If you're a parent, Renew that commitment to your children. Whether you're single, married, a parent, an empty nester, a grandparent, or someone, something else I didn't list, renew your commitment to God and a godly home. Make a lifetime, no matter what, no other options, commitment. Be committed to your church through good times and bad. Be committed when you get your feelings hurt or when things don't go your way. Model and live commitment. Plant faith, commitment. One more seed I want to look at today, plant honor. Just like commitment, honor is a decision. Honor says you matter. Honor says I love you for who you are, not what you do. I honor you, who you are and how God made you. I choose to put you first, and in choosing to put you first, I choose to be second. I have decided that what you need is more important than what I want. I have a lot of opinions. I want a lot of things. I choose to put your needs before my desires. That's honor. Honor selflessly serves. Those aren't just things you say. Those are decisions you make that affect your words and your actions. Honor is a choice. You choose who you honor. We often will have pastors and teams come from other churches to observe us and to learn. And at the end of the time, almost always one of them will say, you know, I wasn't sure if it was true. I heard you say it. But you really do love each other. Well, what they see is honor. It's not one particular thing we do. It's, it's an attitude. It's respect for each other. They see that. I choose to honor Pastor Parker because I have high respect for him. I choose to honor Pastor Rita. The high respect I feel becomes honor I express. Honor is hard to describe, but honor is easy to see and dishonor is easy to see. Other people can sense honor. You know when someone honors you, and you know when someone doesn't. 
We think of dishonor as being mean or hateful, but it's more than that. It's the opposite of honor. Dishonor says, me first, you last. Dishonor says, you don't matter. Dishonor says, you better give me what I want or I won't give you what you need. In a family, honor can flow every direction. Husbands honor your wives. Wives honor your husband. Children honor your parents. Parents honor your children. Everyone should honor the grandparents. <laughs> right? Come on, grandparents. I expect a reaction from that. <laughs> See, I, I give it to you. You should have been nudging people, clapping, cheering on your feet. Here's what happens all too often. You demand respect instead of giving and receiving honor. You command your spouse or your children to honor you. I got a better idea. If you want a harvest of honor from your family, plant honor. It's a tried and true principle. You get what you initiate. You get what you give. If you want love, you give love. You start. If you want affirmation, give affirmation. You go first. If you want gratitude, give gratitude. If you want honor, give honor. You start. One person choosing the attitude of honor can change the environment. I want to show you a, a passage that Paul wrote in Ephesians that talks about honor. Kind of one that's familiar, but it's one that um, we do kind of selective scripture. We just, we choose which parts of the scripture we like and which parts of the scripture we don't, we don't really enjoy so much. Wives, submit your husbands is to the Lord. Husbands love that, don't they? They love to say that. Woman, you need to submit to me. They don't so much enjoy what comes next in that. They just, they take that one little sentence and use that. For the husband's the head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church, and he's savior of the body. Therefore, the church is subject to wives. The wives be their own husbands. Oh, submit. That's awesome. Here's what follows it. Husbands, follow your wife. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Okay, I got a question for you. How did Christ love the church? Oh, yeah, he died for it on a cross. He endured hardship and humiliation and cruelty and torture and a sword in his side and a crown of thorns on his head. That's how he loved the church. Husbands, if you love your wife the way Christ loved the church, you don't have to worry about demanding respect. Okay, some of you liked that, some of you didn't. Let's just... Pass over the rest of that since it's unpopular for you. I'll let you select your scriptures. <laughs> Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. That is a high standard. If you love your wife like that, you don't have to worry about submission and respect. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular so love his wife as himself. Let the wife see she respect her husband. Paul asked for husband to love their wives, wives to respect their husbands. That's a good basis for a loving, lasting marriage. Now he gets the kids. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Parents love to use that one. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. You use that with your kids. If you want to stay on this earth, you're going to honor and obey me. <laughs> you love to take that and ignore this next part. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Paul was describing a culture of honor in a family. Husband honors the wife. The wife honors the husband. The children honor the parents. The parents honor the children. Does that describe your family? You say, well, Pastor Rod, that sounds great, but how do I honor? Let me give you a couple ideas. Number one, listen. Students, take the headphones off and listen to your parents. Mom and dad, turn off the TV, put down your iPhone, and listen to your kids. Really listen. Listening conveys respect and honor. Listening says, I have high respect for you. You matter more to me than this email or this TV show. Number two, affirm. 
Affirmation is a powerful tool. Some of you have a horrible tendency where you spend more time correcting than you do affirming. And you justify it by saying, well, I just want what's best for them, or I don't want them to make the mistakes I made. I get that. But your family is tired of hearing your correction. Instead of blasting on the negative, celebrate the positive. Here's the principle. It's a powerful one. You get what you celebrate. Let me give you an example. Your kid gets her report card. She got three A's, two B's, and a C. How do most parents react? What do they talk about first? The C. You need to raise that up. If you're capable of that in the other classes, you're capable of that in this class. You completely ignore the thing to celebrate, and you said you harp on the thing you want to correct. Turn that around. Celebrate the A's. You get what you celebrate. If you plant honor, the harvest is honor and respect. Some of you have been ranting and raving because your family doesn't honor and respect you and you're not getting the harvest you want. Well, if you don't get the harvest you want, plant a different seed. Amen. If you want your harvest to be lifelong followers of Jesus, plant faith, commitment, and honor. Jesus and others first, me last. It's one reason worship's so important. Amen. It's not just something we do to start a service. Worship is stopping your schedule, focusing your attention on Jesus. Worship helps you get out of that what I want, what I need mentality. Worship is selflessness, acknowledging your need for Jesus. Your family needs to see you worship. Culture of honor that Paul talked about in Jesus modeled, that's completely counter to our world's, world's culture. The world makes self the center, but God's kingdom puts others at the center. Others first, me last. Maybe you're worried that if you put others first, if, you, if you're not standing up for your rights, to making sure your needs are met, that you'll just end up being a doormat. People take advantage of you. Oh, like they did Jesus? Somehow we've made it where if people take advantage of us, then we're not living up to what we're supposed to do. Shouldn't we expect that in the world we live in? And when they do, we love and honor and respect, and Jesus is glorified. Don't be deceived. God can't be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit, from that spirit will reap eternal life. Don't become weary in doing good. With the proper time, you're going to reap a harvest if you won't give up. Don't grow weary. Trust God's promise. Sow good seed, and you'll gain a harvest. It might not come the day you want it, but it's coming. If you're just starting out in marriage and family, put these principles into action. If you've already messed up, it's not too late to start planting good seed. Now, let me show you something cool. I just want to connect these principles, and then we're going to pray. So I want to now put those four principles together. You get what you demonstrate. So you model the behavior that you want. You get what you tolerate. If you allow wrong behavior to continue without consequences, you will keep getting that behavior. You get what you initiate. You go first. And you get what you celebrate. Celebrate the good. Celebrate what you want to continue receiving. That doesn't just work at home. Those four principles work in the office, on the job, at school. When, when we live a life of faith, commitment, and honor, the harvest is rich. That's what I want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I pray for people in this room or people watching online who have been sowing bad seed. I pray for people who... Um, a life of faith is far from what they've lived. 
and now they see that replicated in their kids. I pray right now in this moment they'd make the decision to follow you, to truly make you Lord, to eliminate the other options and completely follow you. Lord, I, I pray for people who commitment has become something casual and whose priorities continually shift. You told them to do something and they've allowed other things to creep in and take priority. I pray they'd, they'd make the decision today. I'm in no matter what. I pray for people who are on the edge of walking away from a commitment, edge of walking away from their marriage, their ministry, their family. Lord, I pray that they would make the no matter what, I'm in this for life kind of commitment to follow. Lord, then I pray for people who are really wanting honor and it's really not what they're getting and they're connecting that it's because it's not what they give. Would you help us in the church to honor each other even when opinions are different? To honor each other even if from different political parties? To honor each other even if we look different or talk different? To truly honor each other, to model that in our families and to see the results of that? I pray, Lord, for some people who've been demanding respect. And I pray instead they would give honor. And as they do, they would get the harvest they've been looking for. Pray for marriages and families in our church that we would sow good seed and reap a good harvest that would please you. Finally, Lord, I pray for this week for the students that will be here for the deepening, several hundred students, as we sow seeds of faith in them, I pray that the, your Holy Spirit would just be powerful in this place. I pray that lifelong commitments would be made that will be honored. We, nothing matters more to us than our kids and our students. So we pray that you would minister to them with strength, and with power, with anointing. In Jesus' name, amen.